Uh, for my part, I, before opening up for questions, I will take two or three minutes, uh, basically uh, to supplement uh, what Professor Srinivasan has mentioned. Professor uh, Srinivasan had mentioned about Korea. I must share um, uh, what, I, what I had occasion to share with the governor of Korea a couple of days ago. I gave him two anecdotes about India's development experience, which I thought he should know. Apparently, the Russian engineers who helped us build the steel plants came to visit after their functional. And this Russian chief engineer, on his way back in Delhi, he was asked, what do you think? He said, well, I've been there in the steel factory in India. I've seen it. Um, actually, I'm a communist. I don't believe in God. But in this steel plant, nobody works. Still, steel is produced. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, so Russian engineer came to a conclusion that there must be a god, at least a Hindu god, who is running the steel plants. That's one story I told him about our steel plants. The second story I told him was the visit of an Indian delegation, again steel engineers, to Korea. As you know, Korea led in terms of steel productivity. Uh, so apparently the Indian engineers went and they were very impressed with the way the steel was being produced so efficiently. So they asked the Koreans, uh, how did you do all this? So the Koreans said, well, we learnt it from you. <laughs> how do you mean? We saw your steel plants, we knew what not to do. <laughs> but, but the more important is not my joke, but governor of Korea's reply. And that is relevant to what Professor Srinivasan has mentioned. He said, well, you're not right. I said, what? Actually, we learned a lot from India and from Singapore. He said that we followed the heavy industry strategy, but we depended on private initiative. So, so that, I mean, that, that was his answer. It's actually mo almost all of our development strategy. Though he explained that the emphasis on heavy industry was more for defense preparedness. And he added that was not an economist's advice, it was a political decision. <laughs> so, in our case, it was an economist's advice. So, but whatever it is, uh, essentially, uh, the, 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 I just thought that I should explain how um, we, we sometimes commit mistakes. Um, we may know some right things, but not the way of doing the right things. Uh, second, um, um, Prasina has also mentioned about the independence of the Reserve Bank of India. Sorry, very, very often they used to ask me, Governor, Governor, are you independent? I said, yes, I am very independent because I have the permission of my government to say so. <laughs> Now, I may now uh, come to a more serious affair. Only I will supplement three or four things. Uh, the, the extent of the drawdown in the 1980s, uh, uh, we see normally only two things. We see the drawdown of the reserves, and we see the crisis. And both, there is slightly more to what appears in terms of numbers. In terms of the drawdown of reserves, Actually, we drew down the reserves which were officially reported. We also had some reserves which were not officially reported. No, I mean, not in a sense, but 1980s when we, draw, when we had the fund program and we did have a lot of resources, reserves, and therefore um, we did not bring in the money that we need to bring in. So in other words, the, the disappearance of reserves was not only the reserves that were shown, but there was even more than that, number one. Two. The secondly, there was another thing that there was external commercial borrowings. Huge. It was not there at all. Last five years before the crisis. Three, short-term NRI deposits. It was not there before. Short-term NRI deposits were taken. Four, short-term credit was taken. And finally, some reserves were kept at the State Bank of India. Reserves are meant to 
dip into when you don't have money. But when India itself doesn't have money, where will State Bank of India have money? <laughs> so with State Bank of India could not produce money when India wanted money, naturally. But we called it reserve. So this, 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 this. my point is that the dimension uh, of the deterioration or living beyond the means was more than what it appears, that's one. But when it comes to the crisis, the crisis also is in some ways, was in a way an exaggerated picture. In the sense that about 20% of our trade uh, was with the USSR. Yes. And it just collapsed. So A, we were living beyond our means. And second, we had a collapse of uh, trade with Russia. And third, we had the Iraq war coming in. And there was political instability also. So all of them happened together. So in a way, therefore, it was in some senses a liquidity crisis, not so much really a solvency uh, uh, in, in, in some ways, not solvency. In fact, that is the reason why the government of India could take a decision that will sell gold, pay up, repurchase gold. The confidence which is the government to, and incidentally, this decision was taken during coalition, during Chandrasekhar's government. The first selling of the gold was taken just on the run-up to the elections. So the, the, the analytically in government of India, since I was involved in the crisis management, so, so this, this is all insider information, but no trading is possible. The constitution has a provision that the parliament will pass a law prescribing a ceiling on the debt. That law was not passed. 1950 constitution. After considerable debate, in fact, in the parliament, one proposal was every loan to be taken should state the purpose for which the loan is taken. That was opposed by the, whatever, the Keynesians. So, but my limited point is, when the constitution says that the parliament shall pass a law indicating the ceiling for public debt, that law was not passed at all. And, but repeatedly, three, four times, select committees, standing committees, etc., recommended. But such a law was not passed. So therefore, the residual fiscal bill, the bar till FRBM came. So FRBM is uh, fiscal responsibility budget management. Uh, so in a way, therefore, there is a, a soft element in the political economy. I think this Gunnar Mirdal, who described our state as a soft state. So it is a soft state. But often, uh, my own impression is very often, uh, our uh, state uh, is a soft, hard state. Uh, soft uh, when you are uh, influential, hard when you are poor.